Hi, I'm James Bond. You've seen me in such fine quality epic chemistry educational videos such as Bonding Between Atoms and the 007 and What's the angle on bond angles? Okay. This is the beginning of chapter 8, where we are dealing with bonding. There's a lot of ideas here that we have gone over in, you know, previous chemistry courses. Now, I'm also going to, at certain times during the video, put up a sign that's going to instruct you to do something, okay? Uh, for example, it might be those of you who have the last letter A through C, uh, draw a triangle or write a, write the word square you know on certain part of your notes so you're gonna have to pay attention and it's a way for people to stay on top of things okay so and let's see let's do this there we go boom so here's chapter eight we will go into bonding so when we look at it the whole point hold atoms together now, how is it that the compounds are formed? Why are we seeing that connection? Well, the idea, guys, it has to do with giving the system the lowest energy. If you have the low energy, there's more stability as a result. So, thus, if you stop and think about it, the bond energy is actually the energy that would be required to make a bond. Okay? That would be kind of important. So, if we look at bonding, there's different kinds. We have ionic bonding, we have covalent bonding, and we have metallic bonding. We're going to deal with more ionic and covalent here. There is also hydrogen bonding, but really that falls under the category of covalent bonding, okay? Uh, and for AP bio wannabes, there you go. That's where it comes in. So for ionic bonding, really simple. The, an atom that has a low ionization energy, now you got to remember, what is ionization energy? How much energy does it take to remove an electron from an atom with an atom with high electron affinity? What is the electron affinity? Remember, it is how much energy does it take to have an atom take an electron and become an anion, a negatively charged Ion. So that's a pretty important concept right there. Okay, so yeah, the electrons move and the opposite charges actually hold the atoms together. So there's a transfer of electrons, okay, where the sodium will have its electron transferred to the chlorine. Okay, uh, it doesn't, sodium would have a low ionization energy and chlorine would have a fairly high electron affinity and that's why the two there are a natural pair made in heaven so to speak but we have to get into more about what's going on here so we have to talk a little bit about coulomb's law we talked a little bit about it in chemistry okay before and the idea is it's describing a relationship between the force the charge and the distance now if we look at the diagram here you'll notice they've got a q1 and a q2 those represent the charges okay and the r represents the distance between or in this case you might think of the radius of a circle okay so the energy is equal to some constant k times q1 n times q2 divided by r which is our distance okay where again q is our charge k is given to us and the r is the distance between the centers that would be kind of an important thing there so here's the thing if the charges are opposites okay then the e is going to be negative and that tells us it's going to be an exothermic uh, thing that's happening, an exothermic process. All right. So if we go back on the other side of the coin, uh, if these, you have the same charge, you have a positive E, and that requires the energy in order to bring them together. So once again, when we talk about Paula Abdul, you may remember that opposites attract. Okay, got to pay attention to my timing here. Okay, so what in the world's going on with covalent compounds? Why? We understand about ionic bonding. How does ionic bonding work? Okay, but here the idea is that the electrons in each 
atom are attracted to the nucleus of the other. This is a bit different than when we looked at ionic bonding because we're not looking necessarily at the attraction of electrons toward the nucleus. This is different, okay? So both the electrons and the nuclei do repel each other. Uh, if you stop and think about it, if I were to get into your face, okay, there's going to be a certain distance where you're not going to feel comfortable, and there's going to be a repulsion uh, thing, certainly. Okay. So the idea is this about electrons and the nuclei. There seems to be some optimal distance, an optimal meaning a good distance, the distance where you have the lowest possible energy. Now, why in the world would we would be interested in the lowest possible energy? Remember, if you have a low, low energy, you have got greater stability, and basically that's what the atoms are looking for is some kind of stability. Okay, so of course the distance in between those atoms in question is going to be the bond length. Yeah, the bond length. So we look at covalent compounds and we look at covalent bonding. Okay, if you have to take two hydrogen atoms, if they're far apart, there's not going to be a lot of interaction going on. They're too far away to have an effect on each other. But if they come closer together, there's going to be some interaction when you look at this diagram. Now, think of those dots. They're not electrons. Think of that as the electron cloud, that region. In this case, for the hydrogen atom, we're going to call it the 1s, okay? Level 1, sublevel s, and the shape of the orbital is a sphere. So when they get closer enough, okay, they're going to interact more, but there is a certain distance to achieve the overall energy of the system, okay? There is a certain distance to achieve the lowest overall energy of the system. So when we look at here, we look at this diagram, we have got energy and we have the bond energy here and we have our two hydrogen atoms. Now the idea is here is the energy is zero, here energy is positive, here the energy is negative. Down here is the internuclear distance, in other words the distance between the two nuclei. That being said, ladies and gentlemen, okay, you notice when the energy is positive, you notice how far apart the hydrogen atoms are. But when they get closer, when it's negative, they're getting a little bit closer, okay? And then when we get down here, this is how we determine the bond length, because that's the bond length right there. It's the lowest energy. Now, why would we want to do the lowest energy thing? Remember, it's about the stability of the atom, the stability of the other atom, and the stability of the system. So that's where we get the bond length from, okay? Now, continuing on in covalent bonding, electrons are shared by atoms. This is not the same as ionic bonding, as you guys know. Now, they are two extremes if we're looking at ionic versus covalent. Now, in between those two opposites, we have the polar covalent bonds, okay? The electrons are not shared evenly, whereas we talk about covalent bonding that the electrons are shared. There's equal sharing and there's unequal sharing, if you think about it. Okay? So one end is slightly positive and the other end is negative. Wait, where did that come from? Well, remember, you are dealing with positive and negative charges even within an atom. Now imagine if you've got two atoms coming together, there's going to be some positive and negative stuff coming. Now we indicate these small charges, okay, using the small delta, okay, that would be kind of important. Okay, as we're moving on here, what about this? So here's an example, we have hydrofluoric acid. That's HF, they use that to etch uh, designs in glass. Yeah, that's it, glass. Okay, so when you look at the frosty stuff in the glass, you can look at that and say, that's what causes it. So if you notice on the HF, you notice how H has got the delta positive and the F has got the delta minus. Okay, well, it's reasonable to say that when we look at a polar covalent bond, it's an unequal sharing of electrons. 
Okay, so if we look here, here's a bunch of hydrofluoric acid molecules running loose out there, unsupervised. This is not a good situation. It, it, it definitely is not a good situation. Okay, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Oh, yeah, there we go. So, absolutely not a good situation. But you notice again how the hydrogen has a positive charge and the fluorine has a negative charge to it. Okay, now imagine we can put it in an electric field like this and then we can sit there and add some electricity. Okay, pika, pika, spew! And voila! Look how lined up they are. They're so nice and neat and orderly. It's incredible. It's just the awesomeness of chemistry. Okay, but how in the world do we go and find out about the kind of bonds that these guys are going to form? Well, you may remember we talked about something called electronegativity. Oh, yeah. Electronegativity is the ability of an atom in a molecule to attract the shared electrons to itself. And this is it right here. So given what we know about the characteristics, okay, we can look at sodium with 0.9, and then we can look at something like fluorine with a 4.0. Now remember, sodium is going to have that one valence electron. It's going to want to give it up. So really, it's not going to have a very strong electronegative force that's there. Chlorine and fluorine, on the other hand, well, you know what? They, they have got a need for that electron, okay? So that's why they are higher. Now, if we go down on the bottom here, you got francium, francium at 0.7 and fluorine at 4.0, okay? Know the trends. That's a really important idea, guys, because then you can make a likely prediction as far as what kind of bonds that you have. You won't have this on the AP exam. You just won't. Okay? Our electronegativity trends, that would be kind of important. Okay? So here, if you go from the left to the right, it increases. If you go down a group, it increases. All right? And the noble gases are not discussed. Well, how come? Well, the difference in the EN tells us. Okay, but I gotta make sure. The bond type. Well, okay, let's answer that question about the noble gases, your fluorine, your chlorine, and because they have their full outer shell of electrons. They honestly don't need to do this. And that'd be kind of an important thing for them. Okay, my time is running low here. It's running short, so I'm going to have to start winding. But look, in electronegativity trends, the difference, when we look at two atoms and we connect them, the difference in the electronegativity is going to tell us what kind of a bond is it. Okay, if it's greater than 1.7, it's ionic bond. If it's less than 1.7, it's polar covalent bond. If the electronegativity is absolutely zero, it's a nonpolar covalent bond. It's a little bit different than what I had mentioned in the previous chemistry classes. There is a, very seldom are you going to have, you know, electronegativity difference of zero uh, for that. So when we look at that, we can look at the bond type. There's covalent, polar covalent, and then ionic. Okay, as we go through As we go through here, okay, you know, you might have to pause this sometimes, but anyways, I got to run through, guys. I'm running out of time here, okay, so this is it. Covalent character decreases as it becomes more and more ionic, and ionic character increases as we go on. Okay, and we're going to stop at dipole moments here for this one. Okay, guys. Take it easy and have a good one.